Hello, and welcome to the lecture. My name is Professor John Eicher, and the title of today's lecture is The More Things Change, The More They Stay the Same, From the Rise of the Enlightenment to the Fall of Napoleon. We start this lecture by tracing the rise of the Enlightenment in Western Europe during the 1700s and its culmination in the French Revolution in the Napoleonic era, which extends from 1789 to 1815. And we conclude with the intellectual and artistic revolt against the Enlightenment via the early 19th century Romantic movement. To set the stage for the dramatic changes I will discuss in this lecture, I want to focus on the work of the famous Spanish painter Francisco Goya. Goya began his career painting scenes such as this. This is the Meadow of San Isidro. And the Meadow of San Isidro was located just outside Spain's capital of Madrid. And it's a place that on the weekends, aristocrats would go and have picnics and relax. It's a depiction of a very stable and well-ordered society. Paintings like this too, Blind Man's Bluff, painted in 1789, the year of the French Revolution, which depicts a group of young aristocrats playing a game. Now, after Napoleon's invasion, Goya's paintings take a much darker turn. Here on the right, we see a painting called The Colossus, which depicts the Spanish people rising up as a giant from the Pyrenees Mountains to oppose the Napoleonic invasion. And here we see refugees fleeing the scene in the foreground. In the middle, we have a painting called The Third of May, and this depicts Spanish guerrillas being captured and then shot by French troops. On the far left, we have a painting called Saturn Devouring His Son. And one can easily imagine here that this painting is depicting the French Revolution eventually eating its own revolutionaries. And this last painting is one of Goya's black paintings that he created later in his life. Disillusioned by the chaos and terror of the Napoleonic Wars and a Spanish government that offered little hope of setting things right after they were over, Goya withdrew from society. He was embittered by the era in which he lived and by humankind in general. And in this mood, he painted this painting, Two Old Men Eating Soup. And this shows a very bleak, I think, outlook of humanity. He painted these actually on the walls of his home. He became something of a recluse. And he also painted this painting. This is another one of the black paintings. It's a, called A Pilgrimage to San Isidro. And here we see the same place as that painting back in 1789, but it looks much darker. It's desolate. And the group of people, these are not aristocrats lounging in a meadow. This is a group of refugees, it appears, led by this, this minstrel in the front who seems to have a crazed look in his eye. Off to the right, you see a young boy who seems to be in utter anguish over the situation. And right in the middle, the only individual in the painting that is looking directly back at the viewer is this individual. And who does he remind you of? Well, to me, he looks like this guy, Napoleon. And he's leading this rabble of what appear to be the mad and the insane and the depressed, and Lord only knows where they're going. And so I start this lecture with Goya's paintings, showing a trajectory going from a well-ordered, stable, aristocratic society through a very dark period and to a final point in his life after all of this is over to an unknown place, an unknown but dark situation. And I say that not to judge the era that I'm talking about today, but to highlight and underscore just how dramatic the changes that Europe underwent during this time period and the kind of stress and strain that it placed on society. Now, the theses of today's lecture are as follows. First, knowledge is power. The Enlightenment was appealing both to the weak and the powerful because it promised greater freedom for the weak and greater control for the powerful. The Enlightenment challenged the West's Christian mythology by uniting and dividing Westerners along political and economic lines and reforging its mythology around the idea of progress, the idea that the future is superior to the past, and this idea of progress will continue to gain strength throughout the 1800s. My third thesis is that revolution means to overthrow, but it also means to return. Between 1789 and 1815, France was revolutionary in both senses. Since the French Revolution overthrew France's absolutist monarchy and Napoleon returned France to a modern form of absolutism. 
a dictatorship. In modern society, there is no going back. Romanticism, which lasted from about 1800 to about 1850, was an attempt to return to the past before the Enlightenment, but it was an imagined past, so it was something new. It was just as modern as the Enlightenment. So who was responsible for putting all these dramatic changes into motion? Well, a lot of men, but also a lot of women. And here I have a painting of a French salon. Salons were convened by women in their homes, and they brought together a lot of interesting, intelligent, educated people to discuss new ideas that were constantly being thought up during the Enlightenment period. So at a salon, one might hear a new concerto, and then they might see a science experiment, and then they might listen to a political treatise. And we can't talk about all of these, of course, but we will talk about a few. The first of these individuals was John Locke, and he focused on the relationship between the individual and the government. He wrote a book called The Two Treatises of Government, in addition to several other publications. And he believed that humans are created free and equal. They are inclined to reason and goodwill. They only need authority to sort out the problems between them. So in reference to the last lecture I gave, the Renaissance, there is a strong focus on humanism. Humans are inherently good. They are not inherently sinful. He believed in natural rights. Humans have a basic right to life, liberty, and property. He believed that absolute monarchies are not natural. Kings do not answer to natural law, which is very anti-enlightenment. He also believed in a social contract. A social contract was needed between uh, the government and the governed to ensure natural rights and limit the excesses of government. He believed that when it came to governance, a direct democracy is not possible. A direct democracy is where everyone votes on everything all the time. But rather, he believed a council or Congress should be elected to enforce the laws and mediate disputes. So Locke's government math is as follows. Human nature plus natural rights equals society as it should be. Subtract all of the unnatural 17th century absolutist monarchies and you get a social contract and representative government. But incidentally, what does natural mean anyways when it comes to natural rights? As an undergrad, I remember hearing this concept in a philosophy class and not really understanding what natural rights meant because when children are born, they don't come out with a contract or an understanding of their rights. Natural rights are an abstraction. They're an abstract idea of what should be good. They don't really describe reality so much as an ideal state of humanity. Now we turn to the individual in the economy, and here we focus on the economic philosopher, Adam Smith. He wrote The Wealth of Nations, which is the fundamental and foundational text when it comes to capitalism and Western economics. He promoted free market capitalism and laissez-faire economics, which basically means let it be. Governments should have a very limited role in the economy, according to his argument. And this, too, recalls our discussion of humanism. Humans are naturally good and should be allowed to make their own decisions and have their own freedom. He also supported what was called the labor theory of value. And this is the thought that labor is more valuable than the materials themselves. And this is illustrated by the picture at the top of the screen, Pin Factory, in Diderot's encyclopedia. And in the next slide, we will talk about Diderot. But this picture shows a group of workers making pins. So as an example of the labor theory of value, if you have a lump of steel that costs you $10 and you can make 100 pins out of that lump of steel and sell each one for a dollar, then by applying labor to that $10 piece of steel, you have created $100 worth of value. He also believed that the value of products should be determined by the market's invisible hand. And this is maybe the closest thing economics comes to having a god. The invisible hand of the market is moving in mysterious ways, and we just need to trust that it will sort everything out. Finally, he believed that rational individuals should pursue their enlightened self-interest, which will help all of society. And what this means is, by you being selfish and pursuing your own economic best interest, 
you get good at what you're doing, and by doing that, you pay taxes and you better society. We now turn to the individual in knowledge, and here we focus on Denise Diderot, a French scholar who lived uh, at the height of the Enlightenment during the mid-1700s, and he was essentially the creator of the first encyclopedia. He ran afoul of the authorities when he tried to define certain things, particularly abstractions such as political authority and natural rights, and so his work was briefly suspended, but eventually it was finished. And he wanted to supply the power to change men's common ways of thinking. And this way of thinking is an abstract way of thinking, the ability to know someone, something, or some place without ever having physically seen it or them. The encyclopedia really represents the triumph of secular abstraction. From warfare to human rights, Westerners embraced making important decisions based on abstract knowledge. In sum, modern governance is based on abstractions. Locke. Modern economics is based on abstractions. Smith. And modern knowledge is based on abstractions. Diderot. But wait. Just one minute. You notice the titles of the last three slides focused on the individual, right? Well, all those individuals were men and thought of individuals as men. Of course, there were also educated, intelligent women across Europe who were also interested in Enlightenment ideas, such as Mary Astle, pictured here. And so her response to these individuals is, well, nice work, fellas, but if men are born free, how is it that all women are born slaves? And the Enlightenment guys didn't really have a great answer to that. They thought it was very smart and it was a very good question, but they passed. And so here we have to remember, no matter how good an idea is, it can't change an entire culture overnight especially if there are no homogenous national cultures, but rather thousands of diverse communal cultures across Europe. And we're going to talk about this a little bit later in the lecture and in subsequent lectures. But at this point in European history, there are no nations to speak of. There are individuals in urban areas that have ideas of a nation of France, for instance, that consists of citizens. But by and large, the vast majority of the population is peasant. They think in local terms. They have local politics. They have local economics. They have local patois or dialects. They don't care, nor do they want to be involved in a national culture. That transformation from local cultures to national cultures would take a century to change, starting with the French Revolution, which is really the mother of all modern Western revolutions. So to set the stage for this revolution, we have to focus on the French fiscal crisis in the latter part of the 1700s. There's a lot of domestic debt in France at this time. Louis the 14th, 15th, 16th, they're all very extravagant kings. They're absolute monarchs, right? And they like spending money on making themselves look powerful. They also like spending money on war. And they fought the Seven Years' War from 1756 to 1763 against the British, and they lost. This war in the United States is called, often called the French and Indian War. And then they also lost money on the American Revolutionary War. And here, they backed the right horse. France gave or lent over $2 million to the United States. But they gained very little in the ensuing Treaty of Paris. The United States, incidentally, stopped paying interest in 1785 and defaulted on that debt in 1787. So if the French monarchy ever comes back into power, we might owe them money. But as long as they're not in power, we don't, because you don't owe money to a government that doesn't exist. So Louis XVI has a, a very opulent life. He engages in a lot of high interest borrowing. And by 1786, the Comptroller General informs Louis XVI that France is almost bankrupt. City dwellers, these urbanites, wage laborers, merchants, doctors, lawyers, became then the vanguard of reform. So the Enlightenment gets real in 1789. And so the king calls up 
the Estates General. It's a meeting of the three estates from across France. The first estate was the clergy. The second estate was the nobility. And the third estate were commoners. And commoners meant everything from peasants to educated lawyers and doctors and so forth. Now, an estates general hadn't been called for 150 years because, remember, France exists under an absolute monarchy. The king doesn't need any help, nor does he need any advice from anyone else to run his kingdom. But now that there is a financial crisis looming, he is required to call up this estates general to try and figure out a solution to these fiscal problems. So all of these estates come together in the early summer of 1789. Just earlier in the spring of 1789, there had been crop failures, increased food prices, and increasing tax worries. And so the third estate is especially angry because they pay all the taxes and proportionally they owe much less land. So in June 1789, the third estate comes to the estates general, looks around, and immediately leaves the estates general because they discern that not many of their concerns are going to be addressed. And the Estates General is convened in Versailles, which is the king's palace outside of Paris. And when the uh, third estate leaves the Estates General, they just kind of walk a few doors down to the tennis court and they take what is called the tennis court oath. And they wanted to establish a constitution and a parliament. They wanted to reform the administrative, judicial, and tax systems, establish freedom of the press, and standardize weights and measurements. And that last one is very enlightenment, right? This idea of standardizing of some sort of rational plan uh, and universal plan for organizing knowledge. But the king doesn't like this. <laughs> and he calls up the army, and the army surrounds Paris. And this is not a good thing to this newly formed National Assembly that had come out of the Third Estate and met at the tennis court. And so as this is happening, revolutionaries that are living in Paris start to get worried, nervous. On July 12th, Camille Desmoulins shouts, Citizens, royalists may perhaps be preparing a St. Bartholomew massacre of patriots. And this revolutionary appeal can be broken down because he's saying a lot within it. What is he assuming? Well, he assumes that the nation of France exists. At this point, the nation of France is still an idea, an urban idea. He also assumes the citizens of France are united. They're not, really, because they're not even citizens yet. They're still subjects of the king. He also said French citizens can enact their own will. Once again, there's no citizens, really. And how do they enact their own will if they don't even have that right under the monarchy? And he's also making reference here to the Bartholomew's Day Massacre in 1572, which was a massacre of Protestants living in France. So on July 13th, these citizens seize guns from the Hotel des Invalides in Paris. And on July 14th, they storm the Bastille to get ammunition for those guns. This is the storming of the Bastille, a foundational event in the patriotic memory of the French nation. And what did we accomplish here? Well, a hundred died. The revolutionaries killed a guard. They freed seven prisoners, including a deviant nobleman, two madmen, and a forger. Wow. <laughs> Big deal. And so the National Assembly is freaked out by this news. They thought it was disastrous. And they even spun it as royal intrigue. Oh, this can't possibly be happening. Because previously, French patriots believed violence is irrational, right? They're enlightened. They're not violent. The Paris press, right, though, is supporting these individuals as citizens and as soldiers of the nation. They're using those words to label the attackers. And so the National Assembly wants to figure out what is actually going on, and they visit Paris to see for themselves. And when they arrive, they discover these revolutionaries in Paris love them. They greet them as kings. They like us. They really like us. And so on July 20th, the National Assembly interpreted the storming of the Bastille as rational. This is rational violence. This is good violence of citizens rather than the bad violence of a mob. And in so doing, they redefined revolution as a legitimate rising of a sovereign people based on abstract concepts of freedom and equality. 
This could have been labeled as an uprising, a revolt, a riot, a mutiny, an insurrection, or rebellion. But the assembly and the patriotic press claimed it was rational violence for a legitimate purpose by citizen soldiers of the nation. In other words, you gotta win the spin. And one's reminded here of the battles between American Indians and the U.S. military in the 1800s. When American Indians remembered certain conflicts, they thought of them as massacres because women and children were killed. But the U.S. government always sold those battles to the public as battles, battles between two different militaries. Moving on, I cannot encompass the entire French Revolution within this lecture. It would take an entirely different lecture series. But to be brief, there is at first a moderate phase. This National Assembly overthrows the king, but they don't know how far they should go. And so they keep getting pushed further and further to the extreme. And this is the radical phase where you have the terror, where no one feels safe because anyone could be accused of being a counter-revolutionary. And eventually, when everyone has been beheaded, there's nowhere else to go, and the French turn to the conservative phase. And then soon thereafter comes the Napoleonic phase, and Napoleon comes in and finally gives society the sort of stability it needs so it can go on. And the French Revolution is the template for European-style revolutions that would happen over the next 200 years. An oppressive government is overthrown by moderate opposition. Moderate opposition is pushed to extremes by radicals, and radicals are neutralized by a dictator, and then a dictator becomes overthrown later by new opposition. Basically, everything got really bad really fast for aristocrats, clergy, and people who are fonder of the Catholic Church than the new government. But to stabilize the situation, here comes the world's first absolute dictator, Napoleon. And here we see a picture of him crowning his wife, Josephine. And who do you want to guess crowned Napoleon? It was Napoleon, because there's no one higher than him, not even the church. So Napoleon reforms. One of his biggest concerns is reforming the French bureaucracy. Now, the revolution destroyed intermediary institutions between individuals and the government, like the church, the nobility, and workers' guilds. Now, citizens directly confronted a central government. So the Enlightenment promoted individual freedoms and collective equalities. And Napoleon couldn't really take those away once he was in power. So he issued the Napoleonic Code, which gave all male citizens equal rights under the law, including the freedom of speech, the right to religious dissent, and a public trial by jury. But, of course, these rights did not extend to women, and he also reintroduced colonial slavery. And to ensure the rights that were now given to white men, the country needed a powerful bureaucracy. And bureaucracies were historically legitimated, they could expand indefinitely, and they were ideologically neutral. Any kind of government can use a bureaucracy. So he recast the French bureaucracy based on merit and efficiency, rather than the people you knew or your relatives. And so the fruits of a popular government right, must be efficient to please taxpayers. You need a bureaucracy for efficiency. Bureaucracy also aided control over a potentially revolutionary population, right? If it happened before, it could happen again. And so, greater control required greater surveillance, which required greater bureaucracy, which resulted in greater control. You see the arms race. Thus, the Enlightenment promised greater freedom for individuals, but also greater control for governments, and eventually, businesses. The Enlightenment ideas combined with bureaucracy to... Democratize taxes. Everyone must pay. Popularize national censuses. Everyone is counted. Increase state surveillance and institutionalize prisons. Everyone is equal under the law. And during the Enlightenment, we finally see a trend towards believing that criminals can be rehabilitated and reformed. And here we have a very interesting picture of an Enlightenment prison. This prison is called the Panopticon, and it was created by Jeremy Bentham. And it's very clever because one or two guards can stand in the central column there, and all the prisoners are facing that column, as you can see, 
And you can govern a large population using very little manpower because the prisoners never know if they're being looked at by those guards or someone else. So everyone remains on good behavior, even though they might not be being monitored. And I think this is especially interesting considering the society in which we live in, where we are video recorded pretty much everywhere we go. Enlightenment ideas also combined with bureaucracy to require men to join a citizen's army. Conscription. Everyone must fight. And here we see a picture of Napoleon's army retreating from Russia. It also promoted public education. Everyone must learn the rules of society and grow the economy. The Enlightenment therefore promised individual freedom and social equality. But is it possible to have unlimited amounts of both? This is a difficult question. Because the more freedom you give a population, the less equality there will be. And the more equality you enforce on a population, the less freedom there will be. So, would you err towards freedom or equality when it comes to making money? Well, it depends on how good you are at making money, maybe. What about military conscription? Freedom or equality? Access to education? I think most people would say equality. But quality of education? I think a lot of people would say freedom. So there's always a constant tension in a democratic society between freedom and equality. So Napoleon sets off across Europe to try and conquer the entire continent, and he does a pretty good job of it for a while. His popularity at home really hinged on this military success abroad. And here in the top left of the screen, you can see his slow creep across Europe. With his citizen army, he conquered most of Europe, he used collaborative local leaders to enforce his Napoleonic Code, which often promised more freedom and opportunity than prior regimes. But he also angered a lot of people, and he spread revolutionary ideas. Napoleon was a great tactician, to be sure. But a lot of his success also came from the fact that he gave all of his peasants guns, which was an absurd idea at the time. At the time, you still had a lot of mercenary armies, paid professionals. Napoleon, if he needed more people could just say, I need more people, go to the countryside, round up 30,000 more individuals, give them guns, and send them into the field. His citizen army was massive. And so as it stomped across Europe, it really angered a lot of people. With the old monarchies deposed, guerrilla militias used revolutionary language to nepo oppose Napoleonic rule. The revolutionary cat was out of the bag. And this sounds a lot like imperialism. Europeans go abroad, they bring their European ideas of freedom and equality, and guerrillas use those ideas to fight back against the Europeans themselves. So the more things change, the more they stay the same. A note here on enlightened racism. Now there's one thing all enlightened white Westerners agreed on. Slaves should not be free. They're too profitable. And so, the only leader more badass than Napoleon was the Haitian leader and general Toussaint Léouverture. And Toussaint Léouverture was a free black man in Haiti who, when hearing of the French Revolution and the idea that all men are free and equal, said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. When the National Assembly went back on that promise, he led the only, only successful slave revolt in history. Sorry, Spartacus. In fact, he not only opposed Haitian overlords that lived in Haiti, but also the French military and the British military. And the French and the British were not too fond of each other at this time. Isn't it nice to see enemies getting along? In fact, the British even offered Toussaint Léouverture a crown uh, to be king of Haiti. And he said, no, he's a revolutionary. And so as you can imagine, after... Toussaint Léouverture finally beat back uh, the French, the British, and the native whites. This did not go very well for Haiti. The U.S., for example, embargoed trade and refused to acknowledge Haitian independence until 1862. Here, too, the more things change, the more they stay the same. A note on average people. After Napoleon, France became a constitutional monarchy under the rule of Louis XVIII, who was the brother of Louis XVI. But life changed little for most French people, who were still mostly peasant. They still had to work, eat, sleep, repeat. 
there was still no French nation. That would come later, and it would take a hundred years to build. And there's a really great quote from this historian Eugene Weber. Up until World War I, quote, about the only historical event that served as a chronological milestone for all French people was the revolution. Storytellers placed the departure of fairies at the time of the revolution, but they were not quite sure when these events happened, and reference to them seems to have meant simply a long time ago. And I think that's a fascinating quote, because it says that all of the people in this area we now call France did remember the revolution, but they didn't remember it as the time they became French people. They started saluting a French flag. They felt like they had freedom and equality. They pegged it to the time when their older mystical ideas of the world, like fairies, started to disappear. And they couldn't even name the date precisely, right? It was just a long time ago. But even though the revolution didn't turn these peasants into French people overnight, it still demonstrated that, the big, that big political and social changes can happen fast. Timeless institutions can be destroyed overnight. Is this inspiring or terrifying? Well, both. And that brings us to Romanticism, or in other words, the Romantic Movement, which lasts from about 1790 to 1850. So Romanticism is a reaction against the Enlightenment. And one could say that the ideological foundations come from an individual named Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, a Swiss French thinker uh, who believed that society corrupts humans, and he advocated a return to nature. Now, Rousseau is very interesting because he used Enlightenment thought to oppose Enlightenment assumptions. Enlightenment assumptions were that civilization is good. The, these, these urban areas are a hotbed of good ideas and great ways to improve society. And Rousseau comes along and using Enlightenment argumentative techniques says, actually, civilization is bad. It corrupts people. It makes them greedy. It makes them vain. Children should be born and raised in nature, and only then should they be allowed to enter society. And here on the right is a typical Romantic era painting by Thomas Cole, uh, Romantic paintings in the early 1800s, they're typically pastoral, they show the natural environment, or they might show peasants doing peasant things. And so 19th century Romantics wanted to reclaim traditions and cultures that they thought were lost in the Enlightenment. They're interested in religious imagery, like this painting by William Blake on the right, because it emphasizes emotion over rationality but they're not really that interested in worshiping God. And as a result, Romanticism is entirely modern. They're not going back to a past where they would have felt very strongly about worshiping God. Romantics are also interested in peasant culture because it symbolized the opposite of the Enlightenment, but they're not really interested in actually living like peasants. And so it's entirely modern. And Romanticism developed in two places. First, the German-speaking lands as a reaction to the French Revolution. And it also developed in Great Britain as a reaction to industrialization. And Great Britain was the first place uh, industrialism really started to take hold. And it helped form the popular distinction between the arts and humanities and STEM, you know, right brain, left brain, etc. Finally, it produced the stereotype of the artist and intellectual as a self-tortured or anxious or depressed lone soul. And here we have a picture of Vincent van Gogh having just cut off his ear in an emotional binge. And on the right here, we see Eminem, who still has both of his ears, thankfully, but still exhibits this sort of emotional, introspective or depressed character in a lot of his songs. So to summarize, sort of quick and dirty uh, comparison between the Enlightenment and Romanticism, uh, the Enlightenment emphasized science and objectivity. Romanticism embraced intuition and subjectivity. Enlightenment emphasized the greatness of the past to imagine a better future. Romanticism questioned the greatness of the past and the future and often idealized the past. The Enlightenment emphasized humans' power over nature. Romanticism emphasized the power of nature over humans. The Enlightenment emphasized the wonder of human civilization. 
while Romanticism emphasized the wonders of the natural world. In short, the Romantic movement was a negative reaction to the Enlightenment, just like the Renaissance was a negative reaction to what Renaissance scholars called the Dark Ages, but I think a better term for it is the Medieval Period. But you can never go back. Romanticism was an attempt to return to the past, but it was an imagined past, so it was something new. It was just as modern as the Enlightenment. And now we will see a Romantic critique of civilization uh, by Cole Thomas. This is called The Course of Empire Destruction. It's a series of paintings that shows the rise and fall of civilization through the eyes of a very quintessential Romantic painter. Here we have on the right, the savage state. This picture depicts uh, an ideal state of nature. It's a healthy world unchanged by humanity. Humans are there, right? They have fire and teepees, it looks like, and they're running through the forest, but nature prevails. Now we reach the Arcadian or pastoral state, and this shows humanity at peace with the land. The environment is altered, but it does not endanger humanity. You can see they have technology, but they're not destroying or overly modifying nature. And this may be what Rousseau wanted civilization to really look like. Third, we have the consummation of empire. This shows the decadence of civilization and foreshadows its fall, because this, right, is not sustainable. Destruction follows the sack and destruction of the city by hostile forces, and then finally desolation. This indicates that all civilizations die, oftentimes by their own hand. So at this point, do any books, movies, television shows, or video games come to mind? Is there any romantic media that you have consumed lately? Well, it's everywhere. Mad Max. The Road by Cormac McCarthy, Fallout 76, a video game, The Walking Dead, The Terminator series, World War Z, Planet of the Apes, Metro Exodus, another video game, I Am Legend, and finally, Frankenstein, which is really the mother of this kind of genre of apocalyptic media. And why is Frankenstein foundational to this? Well, it really embodies all of the romantic themes that I've been talking about. It was written in 1818 by Mary Shelley. It's called Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus. And I should note, Frankenstein is the doctor uh, or the scientist in the book. The monster is not Frankenstein. But anyways, Frankenstein was influenced by many uh, different romantic themes, uh, including emotionality and tragedy. Mary Shelley had just lost a child before she wrote the book. And this prompted her and her husband to go to uh, Switzerland, rent a chateau with their friends, and spend the summer there. And while they were there, they set the task uh, to themselves for coming up with scary stories every night uh, that they would tell each other around the fire. And Mary Shelley's story became the book Frankenstein. There's a lot of adventure in nature within the book Frankenstein. He, he travels to the North Pole to try and chase this, this monster that he created. And there's these scenes in rugged environments. There's also Christian and Greek mythology interwoven throughout the plot. Uh, it's actually based on the Greek myth of Prometheus, the individual who stole fire from the gods. It also has some biblical, but not really religious themes, like the creation of Adam and the fall of Satan. It's a critique of the Enlightenment. It shows us that genius radical experimentation can result in violence and horror. It's also a critique of science. At the time, recent experiments on the nervous system linked electricity and life. And so this book shows us that taking things apart and putting them back together can have pretty bad consequences for human bodies, but also for entire societies. It's also a critique of industry. The creation, abuse, and neglect of slaves in the working class can easily be seen uh, through the character of the monster, something that is created and abused and then not really known what to do with. And it also is a critique of male inventors who have now stolen creation from women and from God. And so our society is now defined both by Enlightenment ideas and by Romantic ideas. And we live in a combination of these two forces. And that combination can lead to the sublime. And here we see a picture of what's called the blue marble. And this is a picture taken from space. It shows a very peaceful world, and the focus is on the environment. It's a very romantic picture of the world. 
And yet, this picture was only made possible by science and technology, the ability to put people into outer space so they could observe the world from this height. So it can lead to the sublime, but it can also lead to the depraved. And here, I think we know who this individual is, Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler was likewise defined, and his interests were defined by the combination of the Enlightenment and Romanticism. Hitler was a very radical individual in many regards. He wanted to entirely recast society along a new theory of the way that the world should operate. It should be governed by a master race, and that master race should harness technology and industry to make their lives perfect. So it's very Enlightenment in a way. But also that Aryan race comes out of some sort of primordial depths of the world and has somehow found its way to Germany so that it can assert its place at the head of all nations, which is a very romantic idea. So the combination of the Enlightenment and Romanticism can certainly lead to the sublime, but it can also lead to the depraved. And that is the tension that we still see, I think, in our society today. So here, once again, are the theses to this lecture. I'll leave them up for a little bit so you can review them. And I want to take this time to thank you once again for listening to this lecture and the lecture series. And if you like it, please click like.